Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Death Retto channel. One of the things that I really like is when creators cross genre lines and they do something that they don't normally do. For example, in music, one of my favorite albums is when Bruce Springsteen did a collection of folk songs with a very good band behind him. That was pretty interesting. A lot of the songs were stuff that I'd sung as a kid in school. Likewise, in literature and books, I enjoy it when a writer who is famous for one sort of writing will attempt a different kind. In this case, we have a renowned urban fantasy writer, Jim Butcher, doing a work of steampunk. And when I heard about that, I had to check it out. The title, The Aeronaut's Windlass, and the pirate-themed cover also seemed promising. Now, this was published back in 2015, and since nothing of the sort had come out lately, I thought, well, unfortunately, it's going to be a one-off. But, but just last year, 2023, a sequel appeared. So I had to get that as well. Now, this video is about these two books and the series called Cinder Spires. How do they measure up as steampunk? Jim Butcher is a fantasy writer from the American Heartland. He made his name writing the urban variant of fantasy. You know, the stuff that takes place in the present day in our current world. Not, you know, not in the refined, you know, classic world of Tolkien, but, you know, sort of gritty and modern. His most famous series is The Dresden Files. It's about a wizard, a wizard PI or detective, something like that, who lives in Chicago. And it's really fun because part of the problem with his powers is that they nullify a lot of modern technology. So he can't have a cell phone. He can't drive a modern car, for example. That series is so popular, he's written 17 books. I have read only the first one which was called Stormfront. And I did enjoy it, though at the time it really wasn't my cup of tea. May pick it up some other point. He also has another series called Codex Alera, and there's eight volumes in this one. It's kind of a Roman Empire-themed fantasy uh, with magic in it, of course. He is definitely a very prolific writer. Now, this series, Cinder Spires, is the third one with two whole books in it. Though the Cinder Spires has many of the elements of steampunk, including airships, aristocracy, and sword fights, it doesn't have the most important thing, which is steam power. That's not a criticism, it's just an observation. The main reason for this classification, I think, was probably marketing. And I mean, in 2015, steampunk was still fairly popular, at least at the time he started writing it, I'm sure it was. You know, the woke world kind of made it bad, <laughs> you know, kind of made steampunk a bad thing. It's interesting to note, however, that the second book was still published by the same publisher as the first, Penguin, which I think is in Random House. And that means that perhaps the stigma associated with steampunk, the colonialist <laughs> libel that they throw on it, perhaps that's fading away. Let's hope so. First of all, this is a fantasy steampunk, as could be expected from Butcher's oeuvre, his existing work. It takes place on a very dangerous world where humans live in gigantic buildings called spires. They're like these great cylinders, two miles high, over a mile wide. And they are our colonies in the sense that they're sort of self-contained. They're, they're cities in themselves. Uh, but it's not for some kind of highfalutin ecological reason. It's for sheer protection because the world is dangerous. It's trying to kill them. There's this toxic fog that envelops the planet. You can't even see the surface from up above. And there's these fearsome monsters, some of which float in the air and some of which occupy the surface. Though we really don't know if it's supposed to be a fantasy version of the Earth, a devolved dystopia 
in the far future or an entirely fantastic world, we do notice that the different spires, which are all political entities on their own, are reminiscent of Earth nations. For example, Spire Albion, which is where all the protagonists come from in the first book, is an archaic name, that is Albion is an archaic name for Great Britain. Their enemy is Spire Aurora. It may not be obvious who they're supposed to be, but then we find out that all the characters have Spanish names. You know, Diego del Carroza and stuff like that. <laughs> Some of which are very long. <laughs> and it uh, obviously is Spain. The second book brings in another spire called Spire Olympia. I'm not sure if that's Greece or not. They don't get into that too much. I believe there was a third that was reminiscent of Africa. But they aren't really as well established. The technology of this world is either regressed or stalled at around the 19th century with airships used for transit between the spires. They're kind of like islands in a vast world ocean. It reminds me a lot of some of the stories about human colonies on water worlds in which the land is so scarce that they have to make the best use of it and they build giant arcologies for people to live in. The technology in this case, the technology of the airships, is not so much plausible like it is in most steampunk. In most steampunk, it's hydrogen lift helium, or sometimes hot air. In this case, it is crystals, power crystals, <laughs> uh, which is a plausible sounding technology, though, of course, completely made up. Uh, and these crystals are not mined, but grown in vats. And somehow they contain all this energy, which provides both the lift and the propulsion for these amazing airships. And also, they power a lot of weapons. These weapons can, you know, discharge a lightning bolt to fry your enemies. Although they still do have old-fashioned, you know, old-fashioned uh, gunpowder weapons. And in some cases, these are better, which they kind of get into as the story goes. There's also kind of an alchemical type of practice or science called etherealism, which utilizes crystals as well. And it has the effect of gradually driving its practitioners mad. So they have to develop these weird little OCD uh, practices to kind of keep a grip on reality. It's interesting. There is a large cast of characters, many of which have a larger than life quality. There's they're heroic or they're villainous or they're crazy <laughs> or they're hilarious. All sorts of things. There are normal humans and there are warrior born which are generally stronger and fiercer than regular humans. They have cat -like eyes, which symbolizes their animal type nature. And they have greater appetites, both for food and for sex. <laughs> They're also cats that talk. You may recall that the sentient talking dogs were my favorite part of Travis Corcoran's Aristillus series, because, in part because they had dog-like personalities. Uh, some of them were kind of autistic. You know, a dog is kind of autistic when you think about it. Uh, this is a similar thing, except, of course, with these cats, they have cat personalities. They're very arrogant. They're, very, they're selfish. They're violent. You know, all those good things about cats. They're also smart enough that they can be used as spies, which actually plays into the story quite a bit. The main character, where the first of many, is... Francis Grimm, and he is called the Grimm Captain by one of the etherealists. He is an air privateer of Albion. He was formerly a naval captain, but was kicked out of the Navy in disgrace. We soon find out that he is really a fairly good guy. In fact, he was being noble. He took responsibility for this disaster to keep his best friend from being booted from the service. And so he took responsibility and, and, you know, there's this bonds of friendship type of loyalty thing, which is really great. I really enjoy that. And it, it feels very real. There are a fair number of significant female characters as well. This book follows the modern practice of having certain women getting into male centric roles. Although it doesn't overdo it, which I appreciate because, you know, if you want to be realistic at all, 
Curiously, men are stronger and more aggressive, so you won't find that many women uh, being in the military, just the way, it, the way it happens. There is lots of action. In particular, there are battles upon and between airships. We have swords, we have cannons, we have guns and electrical weapons. And fight scenes are difficult to write, so I give Jim Butcher kudos for doing them very well. There are complicated relationships between the many characters. Some are family, some are lovers, some are enemies and rivals, and all that stuff. It's a little reminiscent of Game of Thrones without the incest. <laughs> and better paced. For example, one of Grimm's antagonists is Calliope Ransom. Great name there. Uh, the captain of a rival airship who happens to be his ex-wife. The first book, The Aeronauts Windless, was published in 2015, as I said, by Penguin. It focuses on Captain Grimm and his very complicated situation, including the fact that his beloved ship Predator has been damaged in combat. He needs to raise money to fix it. In consequence, he takes a job with the monarch, called the Spyrarch of Albion, kind of an espionage-related job. And... This gets him into more trouble and tangles. And he also tangles with his dangerous ex-wife, for example. We meet a lot of other characters, some of whom are on his side, some of whom are against. We meet the Spyrarch, who is kind of an odd character, kind of an oddball. Uh, and uh, we meet a number of fierce warrior-born types, some of which are uh, Rim's allies, some of which are his enemies. There's a pair of addle-brained etherealists, an older gentleman and his young female protege, who is rather kooky. And finally, there are the cats, who are very fun. They are fair creatures who live in the bowels of the cities. And, you know, they take care of vermin. Those anybody who's ever lived on a farm know cats can sometimes <laughs> be vermin themselves if they reproduce too much. In this case, the cats are smart enough to limit their numbers, and they can actually kind of bargain with the humans. And that they'll say, well, we'll trade you this information for free reign in this part of the city. As far as the title goes, a windlass is essentially a nautical term for a winch. And in pirating, it was used to pull the enemy ship up, up to you. You know, to fire out the grappling hooks and winch it in so that you can board it and plunder so it's definitely used in this book, but it's not like the center. It just sounds like a cool title, though, doesn't it? The second book is called The Olympian Affair, published eight years later in 2023, also by Penguin. In this book, the stakes get broader. It's not just the espionage thing between Albion and Aurora. It's not just Grimm trying to keep his ship and his business. We learn about a false flag conspiracy that's meaning to start a war between the different spires and the whole idea is to cripple or destroy spire albion to remove it as a rival to spire aurora so that they can dominate the world behind that is this sinister evil that is sort of behind that sort of pushing the humans along and it's very anti-human and very malevolent and it was hinted at in the first book but in the second book it really comes into play we also learn a little bit more about how the world got the way it is and whether this is really the earth or not now as usual i will do my pros and cons my first pro as usual when this is the case is the great characters i love great characters and these books have no shortage of them they have many quirks, and they come in a broad spectrum of good versus evil. And the nice thing is that they are complicated. The good characters have their flaws. The evil characters do have an occasional good point, an occasional uh, virtue. The action, as I said, is wonderful. Sword fights, airship battles, and in the second book, a rather notable duel uh, in which the combatants fight on a raised platform and one way to kill your enemy is to knock him off the platform so he can plummet to his death. Rather exciting. There are conspiracies. Any steampunk worth its salt has conspiracies. This one is a little different. It's not the usual trope, Illuminati-type ancient organization. 
it's a little deeper than that, in, in which case it's a nice refreshing change. There is humor. Grimm himself, although his name implies that he's grim, he actually has a sense of humor. He actually like jokes around with people, and he is himself occasionally funny. The etherealists, because they are wacky and they have these weird habits, they are funny. Uh, the young female trainee, she's always talking to this jar she carries around with her because she's kind of loopy. And finally, the cats, who have these cat personalities, which is very amusing. They are very boastful. Uh, they make threats all the time. <laughs> they insult humans, as cats would do, of course. Their greatest compliment is to say that you're almost as good as a cat. Finally, I love the narrator, Ewan, Ewan Morton. I'm not really familiar with him from other works, but he does a really good job. He does some great voices, uh, like some of the Spanish noblemen in particular, and the cats. <laughs> Raul, as one of the cats, uh, he has this growly tomcat voice, and he's, he's always uh, very, <laughs> very intimidating, or at least trying to be. Cons. I always have to go into cons because nothing is perfect, right? As far as characters, there are a lot, and it's a little hard to keep them straight at times, and the plot is complicated with many plot threads. So occasionally I'm a little confused. Sometimes I have a little bit of a uh, mix-up between certain characters, especially some of the guards type. The premise is a little incomplete when you think about it. Like, where do they get the resources to feed these huge populations in these cities without drawing upon the world at large. They grow meat in vats, for example. So does the energy all come from crystals? And since crystals are grown, the question is, why do spires ever come into conflict? What are they fighting over? I mean, I know, sp I know that crystals are rare, but you know, I'm not really sure uh, what other than crystal production capability is actually behind their scarcity. So that's an issue that I would like to see defined a little bit better. Like, for example, where did the warrior born come from? They are another race of humans who seem to be mutants, or maybe they're purposefully bred. I'm not sure. Um, but if they can be made that way, why isn't everybody? Because they are stronger, they have more uh, stamina and so on. Though they do have a little bit of problem with self-control. So it's sort of a trade-off, I guess. Why is the air deadly in the middle layer? See, on the top, uh, at two miles at the top of the spires, it is breathable. On the very surface, people can live there if they can keep from being killed by the monsters that inhabit the ground area. But in the middle is where it's, it's toxic. So I'm not quite sure how this works. The cats, too. They're fun, but I find it easier to believe that cats can talk than, the, than they can cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> cats be cats, you know, you know what they say. All in all, though, I very much enjoyed this series. I highly recommend it. My rating is going to be 4.5 out of 5 gears because, you know, the complexity did put me off once in a while. But in general, it's very much fun. I'm not so sure that I'll keep doing this gear rating system because it's sort of, it's sort of pointless because mostly I just review the things I really like. I tell you what is good and bad about them. I tell you whether it's a mature theme or not and so on. But I very rarely review books I don't like. Once in a while, something that disappoints me. Like, for example, <laughs> Babel, <laughs> which had a good possibility, but I just, you know, for whatever reason. This has been my review of the Cinder Spires steampunk series by renowned fantasy author, Jim Butcher. Please let me know what you think about this in the comments and give me any suggestions. As always, I try to follow them if they are at all relevant to this channel. Also, like and subscribe. Help us keep the good steampunk word. And check out my books on Amazon. I'll have the links in the description. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.